Good morning, Oak Grove Baptist Church family. I'm coming to you actually pre-recorded here from my home on Saturday. We realized that uh, there is a storm coming, and so it's beautiful sunny outside right now, but we know by the time you're watching this that that is not going to be the situation. So, just got a really a single announcement for you on Valentine's Day, February 14th, Sunday the 14th, we have something special planned, and so the, the band Kane is going to be with us in person that Sunday. They're going to be conducting the service, a 90-minute service at 9.30. So it's just one service on the 14th at 9.30. And so we're not going to be able to have the Valentine's Banquet this year. We felt bad about that. Wanted to do something unique or special to kind of help make up for it. And so this is what we've got. The band's going to come in and conduct our service for us that Sunday. So we encourage you to be there. Make plans. Bring somebody with you. Again, a single service in the Family Life Center. There'll be more details um, about that coming ahead. Hey, look, I uh, appreciate you guys being here this morning, watching online from wherever you're at. It, uh, we're going to do something a little bit unique. Now, I'm not going to actually be up at the church preaching a sermon this morning. We're going to replay a sermon that we did previously. And so I apologize for giving you leftovers today, but it's, there's a, a little bit of madness to the method here. A number of questions came in about end times, and revelation, and, and those various subjects. And so we wanted to answer those, but we felt like, hey, we've already answered a lot of that in the previous sermon series that we did a little over a year ago. And so we are uploading a video from that, a sermon from that series, and I encourage you to stay tuned, look at it again. You'll be surprised at how much you don't remember until you hear it again. And so I watched it, of course, to preview it. I watched it recently, and, and I was surprised about how much I had already forgotten. So I encourage you to tune in, continue to stay on, and we hope to see you again soon. God bless you. search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together
never fails me Oh my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing Of the goodness of God
So if you weren't here last week, let me catch you up just a little bit. We looked at Daniel chapter 9, and and let me say this from the very beginning. I realize if you've been coming here for a while, there is a certain style of preaching perhaps that you're used to, and this particular subject does not lend itself so well to my style of preaching. I just want to tell you up front, this is a whole lot of information, and uh, it's a lot more of a Bible teaching than a Bible preaching, but uh, we're going to get preachy at the end, so give me just a minute. And so last week, we looked at Daniel chapter 9, and so Daniel explained to us through the the Holy Spirit in this prophecy that there are 70 weeks that are decreed, he says, for your people and your holy city. So for the people of Israel, there are 70 weeks decreed. We understand that to mean 77s of years, 490 years decreed for Israel. And what's going to happen that period of time is God's going to put an end to sin, bring in everlasting righteousness, anoint the holy city. And so everything's going to come to an end, and Jesus is going to reign on earth at the end of that 490 years. So he says, hey, this prophecy is going to start whenever there's a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, they, at the moment in time, they were all taken captive into Babylon, and, and Jerusalem lay in shambles. The temple lay in shambles. And so later on, there was a decree given by Artaxerxes to Nehemiah to go rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the walls, and they rebuilt the temple. And so that started the clock ticking. God says when that happens, there's going to be 483 years, 69 weeks, according to Daniel, 483 years. And, and again, if you weren't here last week, those... Weeks is a mistranslation. It's 69 sevens, and those sevens are seven years. And so 69 times seven, 483 years. And so when the decree went out from Artaxerxes and Nehemiah to go rebuild Jerusalem, it started the clock ticking. And so 483 years later, Daniel prophesied that the Messiah would be cut off, he'd be dead, and the temple would be torn down. And the destruction of the temple. And so we know destruction of the temple happened in 70 AD. And, and so we know that was the bookend. That's the cutoff point. And so we know the 483 years had expired at 70 AD. And prior to that moment in time, Messiah had come and Messiah had died. And so for the people who did not know who Messiah was, God's given them a clear indication. Hey, you can work back from 70 AD. Somewhere prior to that, he had come, he had died. And so now the clock had stopped ticking. At the end of the 483 years, God hit pause on this whole clock, this 490-year clock that was ticking away. At 483-year mark, God hit pause. And so we are in a pause period right now, and this is the period of the Gentiles. This is the mystery that God brought in. Once Jesus had passed away and had been resurrected and, and, and had gone off into heaven, and, and then the destruction of the temple, everything stopped. God paused it. And we entered into a time of the Gentiles. And this is where your notes come in. This was a mystery that people did not understand prior to then. So Paul's going to explain to them the mystery of the Gentiles. Now, mystery simply means something that was not previously known or previously understood. And so God prophesied about this mystery of the Gentiles in Hosea chapter 2. He says, look, I'm going to plant people in my land, and this is going to be people that I did not love that I'm going to love. And these are people who are not called my people that are now going to be called my people, and they are going to call me their God. And so God, God prophesied all the way from Hosea, like this is thing is going to happen. And, and I'm sure the prophets wrote that under the inspiration of the Spirit, and they maybe didn't understand it. And then later on, Paul explained it to them in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, look, the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've brief, briefly written above, and you're able to understand inside of the mystery of the Messiah. Here it is, verse 5, chapter 3 of Ephesians. This was not made known to people in other generations, and it is now revealed to the holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. The Gentiles, here it is, this is a shocker, the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners of the promise of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, through the gospel. And so... Absolutely. So Paul said, hey, look, I'm going to share it with you. This is the mystery. Hosea alluded to it, but he didn't understand it. Other people may have heard something about it, but they didn't understand it. Now I'm explaining it to you. This is what's happening. The Gentiles are now co-heirs. They're part of this thing. It's happening, people. And so God has hit the pause button. And there's absolutely, we can applaud that because we're Gentiles, right? (laughs) This is a big deal for us. And so now there's a period of time where God has simply got everything on pause. This 490-year clock that started ticking at the, at the decree to rebuild Jerusalem stopped 
ticking at 483 years. There are seven years left on the clock. Those seven years are known as the seven years of tribulation or the day of the Lord or the day of judgment. And so a lot of different names in Scripture for those seven years. But right now, we're in a period of time where the clock's not ticking. Well, when does this period stop? Nobody knows. Here's what I can tell you. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. So that you'll not be conceited, brothers, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery. Again, Paul's revealing something else. He said, you may not have known this, but I'm telling it to you. A partial hardening has come to Israel. We understand that. Israel does not believe. They're blinded. For all their own prophecies, they cannot see that Messiah has already come. Israel has been hardened, and, and so until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Israel's blinded to a degree, a partial hardening. Not completely. There are some Messianic Jews. There are some Jewish people that have come to know Christ, and some more will come. But a partial hardening has happened until the full number of the Gentiles. What number is that? God knows. Only God knows. We don't know. But here's what, God, what, what Paul's telling us in the book of Romans. There is a number. God has this number in his head. Paul didn't know it. I don't know it. You don't know it. But there's a number in God's head that whenever that number comes in, Whatever number that is, whenever that final number happens, God's going to say, that's it. Start the clock. And then this last seven years that we know as the seven years of tribulation will begin to click again. It wasn't that fun. Okay. Now, so here's what I want. Here's what I'll tell you of my own opinion. Okay, this is this is not hard fact. This is my own opinion based on my own study. And so you can study and come to something different, and that is perfectly fine. My own opinion is this: that this beginning of the clock, the moment that final number comes in, when God hits the start button again, that will be the very moment also that He will rapture His church, that His people will be taken out of the world. And so people object to this whole idea of rapture. Some of them say, well, you can't even find the word rapture in the Bible. Have you ever looked for the word rapture in the Bible? It's not in there. I was like, well, so why are we talking about it? Well, the concept is in there. And so the concept is that we're going to be caught away. And so in the Hebrew, that's harpazo. Can we get that screen up? The harpazo is uh, the, maybe we don't have that screen. That's okay. It's, uh, and so it's in your notes. If it's not on the screen, it's in your notes. Did you grab some notes this morning? We've got a lot happening in the notes today. And so that's the Greek word of it. It means to be caught up, to be called away is the idea. And so they translated the Greek into Latin a long time ago, like 2nd century A.D., 2nd, 3rd century A.D., went into Latin. And so the Latin word for haparzo, the Latin word for caught up is rapturo. And so if you were reading in the Latin, if you knew Latin and you read rapturo, you would know, okay, we're going to be caught up. And so whenever it got to the English form, Tyndale Bible perhaps or later, we just kind of borrowed the word from Latin. It's called a transliteration. We just took that word and we just stuck it into the English language. Like, okay, we, we know what rapturo means because we've been reading that in the Latin Bible for ages and ages. And so we're just going to transpose that word basically over into English and we're just going to use the word rapture. And we have the word rapture in our English language. If you looked it up, it has a meaning. And, and oftentimes it means like to be caught up in joy or to be enraptured in laughter. And, and so to still the idea of being caught up is at the base level of that particular word. And so people say, well, look, the word's not even in the Bible, but that's really not a good objection because there's lots of words not in the Bible that are still biblical doctrines. And so this word rapture just simply means to be caught up. And you can find it in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going to get there in just a minute. Other people say, well, Jesus didn't mention rapture. He had 33 years on the earth that he taught about all sorts of stuff, and we never heard him say a word about the rapture of the church. Now, if you weren't in the red-eye service this morning, if this is your first service, anybody want to venture a guess why Jesus did not mention the rapture of the church? I know there's a lot of people in here now. Nobody, I'm not going to guess. I might be wrong. That's it. His ministry was to the Jews, uh, strictly to the Jews. And how do we know that? Because the Gentile came and was like, Lord, can you heal me? And he's like, look, I can't take the food away from the children and give it to the dogs. That's, that's pretty strong language. That was, that was you. <laughs> You're the dogs, people. Don't laugh. And so he's saying, look, this ain't for you. And then the dog said, well, you know, even the dogs eat from the scraps that fall from the table. He's like, you know what? You're right here. And he healed them. And so now it's, it's you know, the, the whole gospel thing has gone to the dogs. It's us. But Prior to that, <laughs> prior to that, his ministry was to the Jewish people. 
strictly to them. And so he didn't veer off of that course. And so whenever he was teaching them, he was teaching, he was not teaching them about stuff that was really didn't involve them. And so this whole rapture of the church idea is a very Gentile thing. It's not very much of a Jew thing. There has been a partial hardening. There's not going to be very many Jews that participate in this. And so it is not for them. It was not about them, basically. And so that's why Jesus really didn't talk about the rapture. Then other people say, well, it's just not a biblical concept. And so turn with me then to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And this is where we get the majority of our teaching about the rapture. Also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll get there in a minute. Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by a revelation. Here's where it gets fun. This guy, so Paul's coming out and saying, hey, now, this, is, this is new. This is a revelation right here. This is a revelation from the Lord. And so we're saying this to you, you who are still alive, that the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. Or, verse 16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Woo! I think it's going to sound like that. I don't know. <laughs> and with the archangel's voice and the trumpet of God. I wish I had brought a trumpet this morning. Wouldn't that be fun? Man, we don't have any trumpets here at church, do we? Some of y'all some trumpet players, aren't you? Anywho, if I get one here before the next service, we're going we're gonna to wail on that thing. All right, and um, so the, the voice of the shout and the angel's voice and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so looking back at verse 17, then we who are still alive will be caught up, harpazo, rapturo, raptured. It's, that's right. This, this thing is a biblical doctrine. It's in there. Where's that on my screen? Uh, yeah, there, we'll be caught up. There it is. It's biblical. God said this is happening. This word rapture, if we can just put it in there, those who are alive will be raptured together with them in the clouds, and we'll meet the Lord in the air, and we're going to be with him. Now, he says, look, this should be exciting to you. Encourage one another with these words. It's a biblical doctrine. It's in there. And so Paul's writing this, and here's what was happening. Early church, people were coming to Christ, and they were getting saved, and they're accepting Jesus, and they're excited should I do something with this? What do you think, Billy? A little bit further back? We'll get it right for the next service. All right, we'll try that. And, and so they're coming to Christ, they're excited. And here's what you realize throughout the New Testament as you read it. The people, the followers of Christ, those coming to Christ were very expectant of Jesus' return. I mean, you get a sense through Scripture that these guys were expecting Jesus to come back in their lifetime. This, any minute now was kind of there thinking, you know, this is going to happen. We better get the band together because he's coming back. And, and so people were, were going after it, and the gospel was being spread, and the people were evangelizing, and things were happening, and they're thinking any minute Jesus is going to come back. And then time begins to, to pass by, and some of the believers begin to die. And this was disconcerting. I mean, this was a head-scratcher. We thought Jesus was coming back, and now, you know, Uncle Jim's in the grave, and Aunt Susan's dead, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and people have passed away, and we've buried them, and, and Jesus isn't here yet, so what's going to happen to them when he shows up? And so Paul says, look, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. I'm going I'm to I'm break it down for you. I'm going to give you some 411 knowledge right here. And so Paul says, here's what's happening. First of all, Jesus, God's able to take care of the dead. Do you remember Jesus? Remember that story? This is not a problem for God. The fact that they have passed away is not a problem for God. So look, get your mind straight on that. Realize that same power that raised him is going to raise them. We believe he came up. We believe they're going to come up. And I don't want you to grieve as those who have no hope because you have hope. You have hope because Jesus is alive. The fact that he's already defeated death is our hope. The fact that he's not still in the grave is our hope. And he was writing, this is first century people. They could have gone to the grave and looked, yep, still empty. He's not there. All right, we're good now. And then been encouraged. They said, God is able to take care of the dead. Don't be discouraged by that. And while I'm on it, Paul says, I'm going to give you a little, 
I'm going to drop a little knowledge on you. Here's a revelation. This is from, it's from the Spirit of God. This is stuff that people didn't know before. This is new stuff. This is, this is real. This is exciting. This is completely different. This is a mystery. I'm revealing it to you. That those who are dead, they're going to rise. And then we who are alive when Jesus comes, we're going to be caught up in the air with them. Jesus is going to come with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And those who are dead are going to rise first, and we who are alive remain are going to meet them in the air, and so will ever be with the Lord. Now go encourage each other with these words. It's exciting stuff. It's a biblical doctrine. He says, look, that's what's happening. That's what Jesus has given him through the Holy Spirit. This, this is a revelation. There is going to be a rapture of the church. <sighs> some, people say, some people say, well, the rapture is really just the second coming. We've heard about the second coming of Christ. We know at the end of time, Jesus is going to come back and establish his kingdom on earth and set up his millennial reign. And this rapture is just that. And somewhere along the way, the church kind of got these two ideas confused, and it was just really one idea, and, and the church, you know, because it, they, it felt nice and it felt warm and fuzzy, they decided, well, let's make it a separate idea, and, and really doctrine of rapture came to be about because we wanted it to come to be about, and it's really just the second coming. It's not really a separate event. Okay, well, they're wrong. All right, and here's why. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, ding. And, well, these notes are also in your notes if you're looking for it and possibly on the screen too. Verse 51. Again, Paul says, look, I'm telling you a mystery. Now, this doesn't mean it's mysterious. Mystery in the Scriptures means just something that has now been revealed. Previously, it was kind of hidden or maybe it was alluded to. Nobody really understood it, but now it's being revealed. Paul says, look, here's the mystery. We're not going to all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And he uses the word atom, an atom of time at the last trump. In the smallest moment of time, it's all going to happen. At the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. Because this corruptible must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal must be clothed with immortality. Now, when this corruptible is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will have taken place death is swallowed up in victory. Again, Paul's telling them, look, this is some exciting news, people. I've got some stuff for you. This is not the second coming. This is the rapture of the church. We're going to all be called up together with him. We're going to be changed in a moment. We're going to have different bodies. They're going to come out of the ground with a new body. We're going to come off the earth with a new body. Everybody's going to have a new body in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And so I've given you a chart in your notes that compares the rapture to the second coming. It's the colorful pages down here. And just to point out the fact that these two events cannot be the same because they're so different. Now, there's some similarities. Obviously, Jesus is coming back to a degree on both of them, but here it is. The rapture, Jesus comes in the clouds, and we meet him in the clouds. At the second coming, Scripture is very plain. Jesus is coming all the way to earth, and he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. Not the same event. All right. Number two, believers in the rapture are taken away, and the unbelievers are left. In the second coming, Jesus is coming with the sickle, so to speak, and he is going to take out the unbelievers. He's reaping the harvest, if you will, and he's leaving the believers. They're going to stay on the earth. Separate event. In the rapture, resurrection of the dead takes place during the descent of Christ. As he's coming down, we are meeting him in the air. It's very plain in Scripture. At the second coming, he comes to earth. He takes care of business. He opens up a can on the world, and then... People are resurrected. Ding. In the rapture, there's nothing left that needs to happen. There's no signs necessary that have to transpire prior to Jesus coming. And then, again, this makes sense with the Christian's expectation in Scripture that Jesus' return is imminent. It could happen any moment. The rapture could happen at any moment. The only thing that is required, according to Romans, is the full number of the Gentiles. We don't know what that is. If you're ready for the rapture to come, then you need to be about sharing the gospel. It could be the very next person. Tell somebody. They might get saved, and we're done. Wouldn't that be exciting? You could be the person that starts the rapture. It could be, we, you, we could get to heaven and say, hey, it was you, wasn't it? Ha, ha, ha. Good job. Yeah. That would be pretty cool, I think. Yeah. 
Uh, second coming, many signs have to happen before Jesus returns. And so I listed them for you, but he's not going to go through all of them, but include the great tribulation, the false prophet, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will all fall from the sky. Then they will see the Son of Man coming. In the rapture, we're going to be given glorified bodies. And Scripture says they were neither going to marry nor be given in marriage, but we will be as the angels in heaven with our glorified bodies. In the second coming, people who survived the tribulation, who are still on earth, will marry and have children. These are separate events. There's a lot of separate stuff going on here. These are different things, and so it holds no water. Those who say it's the same event just haven't studied it out thoroughly because they definitely are not the same event. Here's what we can be absolutely sure of this morning. The rapture is real. The rapture is biblical, and it is a separate event from the second coming. Normally, he goes to sleep during my sermons. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. That's all right. I just, I'm talking louder today. It's my fault. I'll take it this time. Next time it's on you. This time it's on me. He's excited. I know. It's exciting stuff. So the rapture's real. It's biblical. And it is not the second coming. It is a separate event. So here, that's what we do know. Okay? Everybody's on the same page there? Here's what we differ on. Well, at least we as far as theologians differ on. Most theologians agree that this is a separate event, that it is real, that it is biblical. But... When is it going to happen? And I don't mean what moment in time. I mean in regards to the tribulational period. When is the rapture going to happen? So there's three schools of thoughts. Pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation. Some people believe that Jesus is coming before the tribulational period starts. Other people believe that somewhere about middle way of the tribulation, before God really wreaks havoc on the earth, Jesus is going to come back and get us. And then there's a third group that believe that the, the rapture is going to happen kind of in concert with Jesus' second coming. And so we're going to go up, meet him in the air, and then come back down to earth with him. There's less, there's less evidence for that one. If you, if you hold to a post-trib rapture, I would really like to change your mind today, okay? Because I don't think there's a whole lot of biblical weight on that. But mid-trib, I could see. I could see that one a little bit. Post-trib, not so much. Pre-trib's where I stand. And so, again, I'm going to tell you that this is my opinion, so I hold it loosely. I think when I get to heaven, I'll realize that, that we're all wrong, okay? But until then, this is all I can do. So this is where I stand as far as the tribulational period is concerned and the rapture of the church. I believe that the rapture is the first thing that's going to happen when God starts to clock back. I believe that is first on the agenda. When the fullness of the Gentiles come in, God goes on the clock, and we go, we're gone. And a moment of a eye, the blinking of an eye, an atom of time, we will all be changed and disappear. The earth will be just void of the church. And you can imagine what kind of pandemonium was set in from that and, and how much angst would become of that. The, the church just disappears from the earth and it's going to be chaos and, and it's going to leave an opportunity for someone who's clever to step to, to step to the center stage of the earth and say, hey, here's what's happening Here's why it's happened, and here's what we can do to prevent this. Come follow me. I believe it just sets the stage perfectly for somebody, because there's going to be a world leader that comes. You'll see it in the book of Revelation here in a little bit. A world leader has to take place at some point, and so I believe this is just going to be the setting of the stage for that, but I also believe the rapture, pre-tribulational rapture, has more evidence, and so here's my evidence for why I believe this. And so if you've got your notes, I'll put them in there for you. Number one, the tribulation is a time of God's wrath. It's known as the day of wrath or the day of the Lord or the day of judgment. And so it's a time of God's wrath. Isaiah chapter 13, look at this. Look how Isaiah describes this particular period of time. Look, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with rage and burning anger to make the earth a desolation and to destroy the sinners on it. Well, we can stop there. This is going to be bad. God says that, look, whenever I come at the end of time in this time of tribulation, this day of the Lord, this day of wrath, it's going to be burning rage. God's not coming down pacifying things. He's coming down honestly to extinguish his rage on the people of the earth. That sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? That is that God's wrath is going to happen in the tribulational period. Now, people who would claim themselves to be mid-tribbers, they say, well, God didn't really pour his wrath out until the second half of the tribulation. Now, I would differ with them on that, but still, we'll, we'll, we'll let them have that for now. Either way, Scripture says this is kind of the scenario we're looking at. 
From the Old Testament prophets, we know that this particular moment in time, this period of time is going to be a time where God just really gets indignant with the earth and cruel and rage and burning anger, and it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be bad. And so that's number one. I believe tribulation is a time of God's wrath. Number two, we Christians will never, you write that down in your blank, never, there you go, experience God's wrath. Never. We will never experience God's wrath. We will never, never there it is, experience God's wrath. Ever. How do you know that? Because Jesus has already taken that for us. God's wrath was extinguished upon Jesus so that we don't have to face it. God has already poured his wrath out on Christ for our sake. He was our substitutionary atonement. And furthermore, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath. Well, it doesn't get any more clear than that. Do we have that passage? Ah, oh, people slacking in the back. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, you can write it, well, it's in your notes if you got notes this morning, it's right there for you. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to salvation through our Lord. And additional support, Revelation 3.10, that's there in your notes, that just simply says that God tells the church, I'm going to keep you from this hour that is coming, the hour that's going to come over the earth, I'm going to, I'm going to protect you from that. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, anybody quote that one? There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We will never be condemned. And then finally, I love this from Romans 4, 7 through 8. And that's not, this is not all the passages that teach this, but this is some of the three of them. Romans 4, 7 through 8. God says, look, happy is the man who will never be charged with sin. You know who that man is? You can put your hand up if you know Jesus Christ. You're that person. God says, I will never charge you with sin. The tribulation is a period of time where God pours out his wrath on sin and on sinners. And it is his time to punish the earth for its sin. And he says, we are not appointed to wrath. We're appointed to salvation. That's what saved means. We're saved from God's wrath. If we're going through the wrath, then what are we saved from? We're saved from God's wrath. I'll go ahead and tell you. There it is. And so Tribulation period is the time of God's wrath. We Christians will never experience God's wrath. And so if I only had those two arguments, for me, that's sufficient. Those are two very biblical arguments that say, I'm not going to the tribulation. That's what I believe. But there's some more arguments. Argument number three is an argument of silence. When God uh, gives his revelation to John there on the Isle of Patmos, John begins to write. He begins to write to who? Who does he write to? Anybody remember? Oh, come on. Y'all know this one. Who's John writing to in the book of Revelation? The seven churches. Thank you. The churches. He's writing to the churches. And he says to the church of Philippi and the church of Ephesus and the church of Laodicea and the church of Philadelphia. And so he goes through the churches and he names them all. And he uses the word church a lot, actually. And then he gets to chapter 4 of Revelation and he's called up and he's gone and God unveils to him what's going to unfold thereafter, and he begins to see in great detail the events of the end time and a word that is missing through the next 15 chapters. Basically missing, we'll tell you the caveat. Basically missing through the next 15 chapters is the word church. And all of John's unfolding of the future events, the church is not on the earth. At least he doesn't describe it as on the earth. Now, we catch a glimpse of the saved people being in heaven, but we hear nothing about them on the earth. We hear about the church coming back in chapter 19 when it comes back with Jesus to the earth to, to take over, basically. But there's an argument of silence. Now, by itself, an argument of silence is a weak argument. I get that. But that's on top of the fact that this is a time of God's wrath, and we're not appointed to wrath, and we're not mentioned in the book of Revelation between chapter 4 and chapter 19. There is no mention of the church in argument of silence. And then there's this whole 70th week we talked about in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, where God says specifically 70 weeks is decreed for, you remember, decreed for? For your people and your holy city. God said, this is about you guys. These 70 weeks is when God's going to come back and fulfill his promise to Abraham. They're going to have all of the promised land. They're going to be a nation. And all their enemies, anybody that has accosted them over these periods of time, God's going to take care of them. He says, it will be a curse to them. If they've had anything against Israel, that's going to count against them, and I'm going to come settle the debt. 
And so God says, I'm coming back. The 70th week is about you. I'm coming to make things right with you. And so we see that when you get into the book of Revelation, God puts a seal on them. He protects them, and the rest of the world just gets it handed to them. And that's, that's the, whole, the whole thing right there. And so that's, now you know all about Revelations. And so the 70th week is about the Jewish people really doesn't deal so much with the Gentile. Not that the Gentile nations won't be affected. They will be, but this is a prophecy about Israel. Number five, Christ's imminent return. Throughout Scripture, we are taught, and you can look these up on your own time, but there's a, a number of verses I listed there for you, each of them teaching us that, that God could come back at any moment. Christ could come back at any moment. This is an imminent return scenario. And so the New Testament believers had that in their heart and in their mind, hey, any minute, you know, any minute now, Jesus could be here. We, we need to be aware of that. We need to be working on that. If, if it uh, is not a pre-tribulational rapture, then that imminent return becomes a calculated return. Tracking me on that? At some point, we're going to see somebody step to center stage, assuming we were here. Let's, let's play that game for a second. Let's assume that we stayed, and we see somebody step, step to the center stage of earth and becomes a world ruler. But, oh, oh, hold on a sec. Oh, hmm, I read about that. And so we would all grab our Bibles, and we'd turn to the book of Revelation, like, well, well this is it. There's a seven-year period or less that Jesus is going to be here. That becomes a very calculatable scenario. There's nothing imminent about that. We're like, well, it's not going to happen any moment. We know it's going to happen somewhere in the next seven years. But, you know, basically a seven-year period of time, we know this thing's going to happen. Scripture teaches us that Christ's return is imminent. So I believe for it to be an imminent thing, for it to happen at any moment, it has to be the lead-off event of the tribulational period. Finally, this should be a source of encouragement. Go back to the First Thessalonians chapter 4. We can put it back on the screen. Don't want you to be uninformed so that you're not grieved. Jesus died. He rose again. Same is going to happen to people that are dead now. Next verse. And so we say this by revelation. The Lord is going to descend with a shout and a voice of archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then we're going to be called up together with them in the clouds, meet the Lord in the air, and we'll forever be with him. Therefore... Therefore, now, he says, now, therefore, when you see therefore, you have to ask, what's it, what's it there for? And so, therefore is there, so that we say, now, what do I do with all that? And he just gave us all that information. Now, what do I do with it? Therefore, here's what you do. Encourage one another. Get excited. Get happy. This is good news, he says. Look, this, that's what I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this so that you will be excited. Here's the reality. If we've got to suffer through seven years of God's wrath, I'm not excited about that. That's not encouragement at all to me. I don't believe that one's right. Okay, so I'm taking that one off the table. The, the post-tribulational rapture of the church is, that's not it. That's, it cannot be scripturally, it cannot be right. Mid-tribulation rapture, those people say, well, it happens before God really pours his wrath out, and they point to Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, where God kind of says, hey, now the wrath is coming out. And, uh, and they say, well, prior to that, or in that, the, I think the sixth seal is what they point to. In that sixth seal, whenever God opens the sixth seal or before the seventh seal, the church is raptured. If that's true, if we're there through the portion of the seals, then we're going to go through some extensive wars. Like the, like the earth has never seen. And, and the earth has seen some really bad wars. I mean, you think through World War II and the number of people that died, it's going to be worse than that. Really bad wars. Civil unrest is going to be across the globe. People will be killing each other everywhere. Imagine not being able to go out of your house because you don't know who's going to be shooting at you or somebody's going to be waiting for you because everybody's going to be against everybody. There's going to be Famine like the earth has never seen. The earth has seen some really bad famines. So bad was it once in Israel that people were eating their children. Now, how much worse can it get than that? This is famine like the earth has never seen. I can't imagine where you go from there, but I'm just telling you what Scripture tells us. We're going to go through a famine like that. And then he's going to open a seal and give authority to one of the, the horses to, to go out and kill 25% of every living thing, I guess every still living thing, because at that point there's going to be a number of things already dead. But at that point, 25% of whatever remains, not humans, everything that remains, 
25% of anything that has life is going to be killed. And we'll have to live through that. If, if the mid-trippers are right, we're going to have to live through all of that. 25% death rate of every living thing. Can you imagine how much death there would be everywhere? I mean, bodies of animals and people everywhere. It would be, it would be a global chaos. We, we, would, we would go into just survival mode, trying to deal with the onset of disease and trying to deal with all of the carcasses and try to get them appropriated to prevent more disease and what to do with all of the dead. Dead would be everywhere, and you're going to live through that, and it's going to be chaos and pandemonium and civil unrest, and there's still going to be famine, there's still going to be wars, and then all, and think of all the people you know and love that would have passed away if 25% of the world's population died today how that would affect us. And then the animals. I mean, I've got eight Labrador retrievers at my house. You know, if 25% of them died today, I thought, well, okay, well, it's less people to feed, I guess, but you'd be heartbroken, right? Your animal passed away. And, and then there's other sadder scenarios. You think, well, 25%, there's going to be homes where the parents are going to die and small children are going to be left there starving to death. We don't think about that stuff because we've not been through it. I'm telling you, I want that, ba- I want that passage back up, that, that last part of 1 Thessalonians. Paul says, hey, look, I want you to share this news, and here's why, because this is supposed to encourage us. Does that sound encouraging? That you've got to go through all of those seals, that you've got to get through all of that tribulational period to get to the rapture of the church? Is that encouraging? No! I'll pass. And if, and if, and if that's true, then this... This is not encouraging, but this is the word of God. That mid-trip stuff is the word of man. The word of God says that this message is to be one of encouragement, something to get excited about. Are you tired of going to work and paying bills? I've got a plan for you. (laughs) It's called the rapture of the church. For $10.99 and 12 installments, and it's free. You can get on board today. The rapture of the church today, you can get on board with this. God says, I got a plan. We're going to put an end to that. You're going to be done with all this going to work and paying the bills and coming home and the rat race of life. You're tired of some of the sorrow of loss or some of the hurt of rejection in life? Some of you I know have been dealing with that. And it's a, uh, you know, and, and you don't want it to be your identity, but Somehow, over the course of time, and, and you've lost some people or some people have hurt you, it has become your identity, and, and you hate that, and you want to be done with that, and God says, I got a plan for you. It's called the rapture of the church. This is going to be an encouragement to you. Those of you who are sick of that, who are tired of that, who are, are ready to be over the hurt or over the pain or over the anger or over the resentment, God says, I got a plan for that. You'll not all sleep, but you'll all be changed. In a moment, in the blinking of an eye, you won't have any of that hurt or any of that pain anymore. I've got a plan for it. It's called the rapture. (laughs) Maybe some of you are looking forward to a reunion. You got some people that passed on before you. You got some loved ones that have died in Christ that you're looking forward to meeting again, seeing again. I've got a a grandfather that I uh, have on good authority was a believer. I never met him. My grandfather Jarman, granddaddy Jarman is what we call him, even though I never met him. My mother's father. My mother says I walk like him. I was like, well, that's an odd thing to tell somebody, but all right. Uh, all I take away from that, he's a pretty cool dude. I don't know. This guy has some swagger. <laughs> don't laugh too hard. Come on now. <laughs> that was uncalled for. I know what you meant by that. Uh, but, you know, I'm told he was a believer, gave his life to Christ toward the end of his life, and, and I've never met him. I, I look forward to meeting him. All my other grandparents also did and died in Christ, and I look forward to that reunion. Some of you got some loved ones that have gone on to be with God. And look, some of you, some of you have some children that you've not met yet that are, are waiting for a reunion. And here's the reality. Whenever we get resurrected, we're going to have glorified bodies, but God's going to give us a glorified mind, too. He's like, well, I've never even met that child. And yet you're going to know it's your child. And they're going to know that you're their parent. There's some of you in this room this morning. You've got some children that you've never met. 
God says, I got an encouraging word for you. You're going to meet them. It's going to get exciting. Paul says, hey, look, here's why I'm telling you this. Therefore, share this word. Encourage each other with these words. God says, I know the plans I have for you. We wrote it on the wall. Good things. I've got good things planned for you, not famine and pestilence and sword. And We're going to face some of that in this life. But my heart's belief is that God has got a plan for us that's going to rapture us out of this world. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll all be changed and we'll be forever with our Lord Jesus. You get excited about that? Amen. There's also a word here that's a little bit more sobering. There are people in your life today, in your homes perhaps, in your families perhaps, People in your life today, if the rapture had happened right now, they'd be left behind. And, and honestly, what scares me to death is there may be parents who you've got a child in your house, 13, 14, 18, whatever, that if the rapture happened right now, the parents would be gone and the child would be left. And that is a sobering thought to me. And so my first heart's attention is, look, parents, if you have children in your home, it is time to have a conversation. Ask the hard questions. Make it awkward if you have to. It is worth it. Make sure that the people in your house know where they're spending eternity. And then outside of your home, you've got some extended family, you've got some relatives and neighbors, some people you love and care for that if you were honest, you would have to say, you know, I don't know where they're going to spend eternity. If the rapture happened right now, they might be left. God has allowed in his grace more time. I don't know how much more but we've got more time. And he says, he's not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering so that none should perish and all come to repentance. God has given us an opportunity. The window is still open to tell somebody, to bring somebody to Christ so that they don't have to go through the tribulational period or so that they don't have to die without Christ. 